Hello, uh, my name is uh, Brant Hunt, that is. Today is the what's 15th day of January, 2021. And my title of my show here tonight is, this is uh, with the issue of Pelagius. That is, who is he? What is he about? And that most people don't even know who he is in the church. And this is intention, that is, this talk tonight is for those who are still in the churches that continue to hold on to a belief that uh, that Jesus somehow saved you from your sins, you see. And so what I wanted to talk to you about is a man who was considered a heretic, in fact, is considered a heretic, not only in the Catholic Church, but also the Protestant churches. And also, I'm sure, in the Eastern Orthodox churches. So I'm going to give you some history. I'm also going to show you right now uh, the how I know some of these things and uh, what we know about him. That is Pelagius. This is a... Uh, uh, one of the books I have here is Pelagius' Life and Letters by uh, B.R. Reeds. This was published in 1998. Uh, this book is in paperback. Uh, it didn't cost that much when I bought it, but uh, it's gone up because there apparently were not many books published with this. That is, with this name, because Pelagius was considered an arch heretic in the Catholic Church and also eventually in the Protestant churches. That is his doctrine of that we are sinless at first and that we are we have free will. So we are in charge of our lives. In other words, we're in charge of making a good, it's a good choice or not. We also show that Pelagius Expositions on 13 Epistles of St. Paul. Uh, and then we have also... Augustine's writings against it. In fact, most of what we know about Pelagius is him refuting back um, from St. Augustine to Pelagius. Uh, and then there's a book here, Reluctant Heretic. Uh, well, Pelagius wasn't a heretic, folks. Uh, somebody screwed you and fooled you. And they've given you some kind of gospel that is in the church that basically is called predestination. And predestination in the church is that those who chose that, that God chose you to give you salvation. So, in other words, you're not capable of saving yourself. This is what is you know as we as we as I've come down to this and I begin to see this uh, probably 10, 11 years ago, realizing this simply is. Um, all mainline churches, almost all churches teach predestination. There are very few that don't. In fact, I don't know of any unless they're a, a minority group. At one point, uh, Charles Wesley and John Wesley were involved with what I call a, more of a free will uh, plan of salvation. But most most of these free will churches or Methodist churches or Nazarene churches or even the Wesleyan church have bit into the apple, so to speak. And they are not, te they claim they're teaching free will, but in reality, they're teaching predestination because most of their seminaries are preaching it, you see. And so, what's happening here is that we know that. Um, Pelagius' writings were burned. His books were burned. The Catholic Church made sure of that because they didn't want others to be a part of this. You see. The major change that took place in Christianity was when Constantine took over. We know that Christianity was before then. It was more of a loose league of uh, churches that met but did not have what I call a uh, a complete doctrine. Uh, each each city, so to speak, had its own church or bishop, and those bishops taught what they felt that was the the gospel or maybe Christianity. 
Christianity starts making its changes, though, in many ways before even Pelagius is on the scene. They begin to invent what we call heaven and hell. And they begin to deal with what I call um, the essence of who Jesus was. In other words, Jesus was God. There are those of us who feel that simply as Jesus was simply a man, they included what I would call simply a man who simply lived a right life. So what your preachers don't know, because they don't study enough church history to even deal with this, they just simply buy into the thinking that, hey, you know what? That's what they say here at seminary, so it must be true. And that's what's happened, is it simply is people believe this to be true. They never really check it out. And plus, um, it sounds great. Do you? Uh, for, for me, simply, as I remember we would visit people and quote-unquote try to uh, convert them, which is a no-no. I believe it's a complete no-no in reality, simply as people choose to that you don't convert them and so what transpires simply is we would um we would tell them simply is the bad news first and then tell them the good news afterwards so we we would tell them simply is that you're born a sinner in other words you want you don't have the opportunity to even choose here see you're born a center you're born in captivity you're born as a slave to sin. That is not because you are sinning, but because of your posterity, those in the past have failed. That is, they sin and they pass that sin in what we call the birth of a child. That is the issue of sex. Augustine had a real big problem with the issue of sex. And he mixed a lot of his thinkings and taught uh, what he was taught even before this, what we call Manichaeism, and believing that simply is the body is bad. He just simply said the body is bad. So this is dualism, and the spirit's good, similar to what we call black and white checkerboard. If we see it in the in the Masonic um, artwork. So let me explain. Let me. I'm going to take something from this particular book here, Life and Letters, from Pelagius. And this this is found on this. It's not going to. It's going to be dates and what transpires. Uh, Pelagius is a monk that came from Britain, so he's not a part of the establishment here. He uh, when he comes to Rome, he's in realization something's not right. So he's the outsider. You have to remember now that Augustine is the major uh, theologian in the Roman Catholic Church here. He has enormous power. And also you have to remember that most of the power in the church did not always reside in Rome, but actually resided in Northern Africa. Because this is where most of the members of Christianity were adhering to. That is, the, the power base was there. That is, the people who came to their Catholic churches was based in North Africa. Later on, that trans that takes place as a change. But at first, it's all to do with Northern Africa. So in 380, Pelagius uh, arrives in Rome and gains a high uh, reputation for those around him as he teaches. He, so he obviously has some teaching skills here, and what he's bringing in to, uh, to Rome, he's, uh, people are beginning to adhere to some of the things he's saying because he's starting to speak out what he's, he sees. And he's what we call an ascetic, a spiritual mentor, and a moral reformer. So the whole idea of free will here is his whole foundation that is based upon simply is that you are not born a sinner. And again, my talk tonight is not geared to those outside the church, although 
many have been influenced by this particular predominant doctrine, man's doctrine, to fool people, to keep them in uh, a mind that sees themselves as a uh, someone who's done wrong. Uh, obviously, they blame themselves, which is part of the blame, the shame, and the guilt that takes place in people's lives who go in churches. We were taught this, and it's taught tremendously in the Calvinistic churches that you are even worse. That is, you are nothing but a worm in the sight of God. So you don't see this fearfully and wonderfully made uh, quote that comes from Psalms or either Proverbs that, you know, God was the creator created man, that he's wonderful and fearfully made. You see the opposite. You see this completely detrimental perspective that man himself is just a worm in God's sight. He's inferior. So you've got to beat him up and put him down. So this is what he sees. But anyway, he meets another likewise person within the next 10 years, a gentleman named, actually two of them, Celestius, and towards the end of the decade, Rufus, Rufus of Syria. And within the next few years, there's dissent begins to take place because basically uh, uh, Pelagius is gifted. He's got, he has the gift of teaching, and he's already making some inroads in Rome. So he expresses some strong dissent from the view of grace, which is revealed in Book 10 of Augustine's Confessions and writes his own book called On the Trinity and it Extracts. And then in 405 to 409, he writes a commentary on the Paulinian epistles. So he's talking about Rome, uh, not Rome, Romans, Ephesians, and other books, Philippians, all the books that Paul wrote. And so by 413, I'm sorry, 411, 412, he stays in Carthage and is condemned by the council there for his her hereditary, hereditary, yeah, heretical opinions. He soon leaves after for the east. Augustine attacks the teachings of Celestius and Rufus the Syrian on original sin and infant baptism. Now, You've got to understand something about Reformed th theology and what it tells you, because what it talks out is called the tulip, and those, those letters represent their theology. And T stands for total depravity, meaning that's why they see you as a worm. So it's a, it's a, you're so depraved. You're so depraved you cannot save yourself. So you're not able to even... Uh, grasp or understand anything. Well, naturally, couldn't understand and grasp anything because simply is uh, Pelagius' books were burned later, and also simply is that Rome itself, the, the Catholics and Augustine had enormous power that they would not allow only their books to be published or printed, and most of monks or those who were divine or what I would call not divine, but actually what we call um, the ministers of the local churches, that is, didn't understand themselves. They just simply spoke in Latin. They never spoke in the vernacular of the, the people they were in contact with. So what happens simply is, is that, uh, as, in, in, so this is the idea. Then with Augustine also is the issue of, he, 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 he starts the, the idea of a doctrine called infant baptism. This makes it even worse because in our eyes as today, those that don't go to church or gotten out of the church, see that the infants, that is those who are born, they're not, they're not sinners. They're not born sinners. No way. Why was something that the creator created and somehow that man messed up? So now it's Jesus, that is God, has to come back and fix it. Well, if he's God, why would he have to fix it? In other words, if he is God, why would there be a problem here? See, this is you see this how they twist this. See, God is you're, you're fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator, as they would say, God. And in reality, they changed it and, and they kind of in some way say, well, okay, somehow 
something met, something went wrong. And so they, they start, this is the, the doctrines they teach. In 412, again, Pelagius writes another book. He follows up with the, the book called On the Spirit and the Letter. Then 413, it starts to heat up, that is. Pelagius comes under attack from Jerome in Palestine. Jerome is the uh, major player here. His, um, his, he is the um, one who tr uh, tr translates the books of the Bible and all of them go into Latin. He's a major figure. He, so the books are all written in Latin. Okay. Not Greek, but Latin. And so he, he's the one who starts this. And probably part of this is uh, Jerome is, and he's a, he's a major figure because he's Jerome in Jerusalem. So he's part of the, he's probably, he is probably the head of Hacho in Jerusalem at that time. Again, you must understand simply is beforehand, before 315, when Constantine took over, all these churches were what do I call loose leaf. That is, they were, um, had their own beliefs, their own thinking teachings within their own locale, not a centralization of, of thought, not a centralization of doctrines of anything of that nature. It was just a certain locale. So someone at Julian at Caesarea is the bishop there. And then you have, um, let's just say, for example, Paul in um, Ephesia, F Ephesus, would have another particular special. So, But eventually this all becomes congruent and begins to become, create what I call their teachings. And that's part of what Constantine's about also. He, he actually... Uh, when he met, there were many bishops that came there at first, and those that disagreed with him were banished. That is, they were put out and said, nope, I'm not interested to hear what you're going to say. So there's only a few left. And these few are the ones who basically begin to write the doctrines of the church and create all this. And they tell you this in church history, but very few people catch on. Because part of it is true. So Pelagius comes under attack from Jerome in Palestine. He writes the letter to Demetrius, from, but Jerome also writes to her, take, talk, taking, sorry, taking the opportunity to warn her against a heroes of originism, which is considered a false doctrine in the church already, among whom he now counts Pelagius. So he considers now Pelagius to be a false teacher or a heretic. That is Jerome. Pelagius defends himself in his treatise on nature. And this transforms, this takes place at that point as he defends himself and teaching what he has to teach. And he he's, has some success. Later on in 415, Augustine writes his own book called On Nature and Grace in Reply. So this is the Implication that grace is interest, introduced immensely also from Augustine. And we have what we call a, uh, from Pelagius, a, there are two types of grace. There's a grace that's given to all mankind. And then there's what they call the effectual grace, which is to those who are chosen. Which are those who are chosen are the ones in the church. You see, the ones that come to church, they're seen as the chosen. And then those who, since to, this is a perfect, alibi is that if they choose to get out of the church then they really wasn't a part of the church after all they were not part of, they weren't effectively called meaning they wasn't a Christian after all now again I want to emphasize this clearly that all churches just about everywhere that is the Protestants and Catholics and that's why they're now concealing that's why they're beginning to gradually become one. The Protestants are part of the ecumenical movement since the 1960s. It's been the gradually to bring these two groups, that is the Protestants and the Catholics, to actually be one. And you're, you're seeing it because a lot of the teachings now is beginning to be um, watered down. And again, I'm showing you from a different perspective because I'm no longer in the church because I see all this clearly. It's clear as a bell here. 
and you're under what I would call some type of mind control or group think that you stay in the churches because you're fearful that you'll go to hell. You've been promised heaven, but you're also kept in that fear of simply as if you don't, you could go to hell. So as Augusta writes, he also sends uh, Aronius to Jerome, armed arm with, arm with two important letters, and an anti-Pelagius dossier to alert Jerome against the Pelagius, Pelagians. Jerome refers to them unfavorably in his commentary on Jer Jeremiah <clears throat> and redoubles his efforts to discredit them in a letter to Sirius and later his dialogue against the Pelagians begun about the same time. The erroneous charge, sorry, erroneous charges against Pelagius and Celestius are dismissed as not proven by the Senate of Jerusalem. So here's a victory for Pelagius, but it's short-lived. And he responds with his book in defense against the Pelagians. Pelagius is accused of heresy by Heros <coughs> and Zacharias, Zacharias, but is acquitted by the Senate of Dasaphodias. Socius ordains priest at Ephesus, but Augustine renews his attack with his own on the perfection of men's righteousness. <clears throat> 4, 416, Pelagius writes his treatise in defense of free will, responds to the attacks of Herodias, Jerome, and Augustine. So you've got three people attacking him. And again, I want to remind you that Pelagius is a minority view, and it made some inroads. But Jerome and Augustine are determined to stamp this out because they see the threat here of their own undoing. So in 416, Pelagius and Celestius are condemned by the councils at Milan. I'm sorry, not Milan. Actually, Cartus and Malevius. And Pope Innocence responds to three letters from the African bishop and the news of an attack on Jerome's monastery allegedly, by, allegedly stated that he attacked it by Pelagius or Pelagians by excommunicating Pelagius and Celestius, while giving Pelagius an opportunity to justify himself either by appearing before him in Rome or by letter. <coughs> Pelagius sends him a letter in a justification and confession of fate, sorted by a letter of condemnation from Praelius, a John successor at Bishop of Jerome, Bishop of Jerusalem. Innocent dies in that is in 417. And the documents are received by Sosmilius, his successor. So there's a change of guard as the Pope here. So 417, Augusta gives wide circulation to his work on the proceedings of Pelagius. Expelled from Constantinople by the patriarch Atrusius, Atrusius now appeals to Pope Zomius. So now the, the handwriting's on the wall here for these guys because the pressure's on because they're now they're being hunted in all parts of the of the Roman Empire in some ways, and they're trying to hold on to something here that is the minority of Pelagius and Celestius. So he appeals to the Pope and submits his confession of faith to him and appears before a tribunal at Rome. The Pope's reserves judgment for two months pending the appearance before him of Celestius accusers, but informs the African bishops that he is acquitting, that he's making him innocent at this time, Pelagius for lack of firm evidence against him and asks them to recognize that Pelagius and Celestius have not yet been finally cut off from the church. Now, in this next year, now Augustine is in Hippo, which is in northern Africa. Okay, so there, this is why time takes, you know, this all takes time. Okay, these are letters or books. Augustine responds with his treatise on the grace of Christ and the original sin and the African bishops by again writing to the Pope, respectfully asking him to affirm the decision of his predecessor. 
So the emperor, Hornonius, now intervenes from Ravenna, alarmed by the news of assault by Pelagians on a retired officer in Rome and reports of unrest there. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but that's just what the reports say. He issues an imperial rescript in which he condemns all those who deny the fall and orders the banishment of Pelagius and Celestius from Rome, assuming them to be still there. The Council of Carthage passes a series of nine canons against Pelagius and the Pope, Tsarez. Now, under great pressure from the African bishops as well as the opponents of Pelagius, in Rome, publishes and circulates a epistle condemning Pelagius and Celestius and excommunicates them. So there's enormous pressure put on the Pope here by the emperor, and not only that, by the people who are in Africa pushing, pushing this issue. They're not going to give this up. They see, they see the blood, they see it, and they want to, they want to destroy it. They want to get rid of these guys. After further in intervention by Augustine, Pelagius is expelled from Jerusalem and then from Palestine, and possibly after a brief stay, stay in Antioch. Seeks refuge in Egypt with a small members of his remaining supporters who are already there. In the meantime, 18 Italian bishops led by Julian of Eclum refused to subscribe to, to Pope's edict. Their appeal is rejected, and they are condemned and disposed from office, and after a final refusal to subscribe, excommunicated and banished from the towns of Italy. So, no, no longer are going to allow this. They're going to stamp this out as best they can. Because the what Augustine has done is simply is you've got to understand his background and why he taught this because if you don't understand who Augustine was before he supposedly becomes a Christian, you won't understand why he defends this because in reality, he is a, a Manichaean. In reality, simply is he claims he leaves that, but then reality is that the Christians are already stamping out Manichaeism. So he has to make a move and he moves in this direction and he clouds the situation with many type of uh, teachings. And those teachings simply are, as I've said earlier, body is considered bad. So any type of sexual relationships with anyone, if you're married or not, is seen as evil and dark and that you're not truly who you are. That is, you're passing down the sins, what switches in you to your children. And with this type of doctrines that uh, Augustine is teaching, people revere him because it's too true. The, the, it's just too true to be good. I mean, it's just it's it's unbelievable that they give you the bad news, which is I was a part of, and then come along and give you the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and He saved you. When a lot of that's talking about right up here, it's not a literal interpretation. You see. You have to die. You see, that's part of your third eye. It's part of the right and left hemisphere of your brain. You see, Golgotha is in here also. These names are there. You see how you've been misconstrued and, mis and misinformed. So Julian, who's uh, again, at once begins to attack Augustine's neo Manny teaching, that is Manichaeism, and Augustine responds with book one of his marriage and conscuspice. So this is the whole doctrine. So Julian knew where this was coming from, and he attacked it. Now, you got to understand Julian is still on the scene here. He's fighting while Pelagius is now banished from the kingdom, that is the empire of Rome, and he's in Egypt. Let's continue on. So he, on the bed, um, so we're back in Augustine on the soul and his origins. Julian replies to the former with his four books to deal with this issue. On receipt of Julian's books, the letter to Rufus and letter in the Romans, Augustine 
published a second book on his own marriage and concupiscences and his work against two letters of the Pelagians, Julian replies with his to Florius in eight books written in Caesarea, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, Caesarea, while he is under the protection of Theodore of Mus. So this must be a bishop, so in this area. Again, Augustine writes six books against Julian to refuse to refute the charges made against him. And that's in 411, I'm sorry, 421 and 422. Augustine sends his treatise on grace and free will and on a rebuke and grace to elate the devils, the doubts of the monks at Had Rumitum. These places probably don't exist anymore, but probably are what I would call probably are in the eastern part of the kingdom, the Roman kingdom. So eventually Julian is put under, uh, is forced to leave the area where he's at, arrives to three others, an Italian bishop in Constantinople, and appeals, and appeals to the emperor there and the patriarch Nestorius. That is the later writes to Pope Celestius at, Celeste at Rome for confirmation of the condemnation of the Italian bishops and is asked by the Pope to condemn them and confirm the sentence passed on them by the church in Rome. His response is preempted by an imperial decree expelling Julian and his supporters from the city and mainly brought about by the submission by Marcus Mercadio in his book, Name of the in 428 and 429, Augustine responds to Sparsus and Hillary as anxiety about the monks of Providence and his treatise on the predestination of the saints and on the gift of perseverance. And then Augustine dies in 430. And leaving his reply to Julian Treasy's unfinished. So he didn't finish the book that Julian did. And then we know that eventually Julian, well, let's take this 431, the Council of Ephesus. Talks about this whole issue, condemns the opinions of Celestia, and confirms the disposition of Julian and his supporters. Julian again flees and returns to Italy, where he is refused permission to receive communion by Pope Sixtus of the Third, which is really weird. And then Julian dies in Sicilia in 443 or 445 in that area. So this is just a timeline of what took place. Now, some of these areas here, this is, again, life and letters. This is all we have. This is all we have. We don't have hardly anything that Pelagius writes. We don't. We have very little. We have his letters that he wrote, and that's all we have. And we have his epistle, his commentary on the epistle to the Romans. That's all we have here. Now, so those of you that are in the churches, you need to ask your pastors this. You need to get, if you really want to get to the point, you need to talk to your pastors. And you need to be explicit about what you're trying to find out. So why? So who is Pelagius? Why is he considered a heretic? Are you aware of that? Pastor, because you haven't been taught a whole lot about history or even doctrines. And most will not be able to say, well, he's just a heretic. Or a heretic of what? You see, this is how people, you, you got to be, you got to, if you want to know the truth, as I did many years ago, this was over 20 years ago, that I challenged my single pastor who knew nothing about what I was talking about, and I, just, and I dismissed him because simply his, he didn't know anything about it. You see, pastors are taught to be preachers. They're taught to be what I call managing the flock of the churches. They're not taught history. They did what I call two or three courses in church history, and that's it. And it, you, you, when you look at this, they don't they don't measure on church history, and when they don't measure on church history, they don't really know what they're talking about. Now they can argue about doctrines, but those doctrines are later on. So in other words, church history in itself and its timeline gives you an idea of something of what is really going on with these doctrines. Why did this? Why did this occur? Why is there a threat? Why did Augustine feel this was a threat? 
You see, why did the Roman Catholic Church in its ways sought to stamp out anyone who actually opposed it? Why did they kill other people? Why did they do all these things? Well, that was acceptable back then. No, it wasn't. No, that's what they tell you. Oh, that's, you know, they, they take they took offense to this. Really? So you don't obey the commandments of God in the Old Testament? You don't obey, you don't obey the orders, I mean, not orders, but the teachings of Jesus? Do unto others, you will have them to do to you? You choose to kill other people? Then your, your, your hands are blood red. You're guilty. And you continue to be in these churches. He said, well, that's the past. Then why don't you teach the truth? Because basically the truth is that all this is I'm talking about to you is, is also false too. But you have to go through this to see that you may be wrong. You see, you only can take a spoonful of something. You can't drink the whole bowl of what you've been taught because you couldn't take it. You would actually reject it. So you have to take a spoonful each time and begin to discern what's going on here. You have to also look at back what I call early church history. That is those who taught before Constantine was there. Why was Constantine so determined to make a centralization of churches, that is Christianity being it, in not only in the West, but also in the East? Because he wanted to unite his kingdom. He mixed actually a lot of that to do with paganism too. But they won't tell you that. And so you continue to believe you're a pastor. You never, why are you fearful of these people? Why don't you ask them questions? Why don't you just see where they stand on the issue? Or are you the ones that are blind themselves? The scales are on your eyes and you do not see because it's too good to be true that somehow you're going to go to heaven after you die. Oh, really? Well, they don't tell you also in the church simply is that they teach the reincarnation deal. In 553, that was eliminated. But that's interesting. That went for... 300 years, a little over 300 years under Constantine, eventually they stamped out reincarnation. They don't teach reincarnation in church anymore, folks. Haven't been doing it for over, well, probably 1,500 years. Why was it in church at first? Why was it taught? Why was reincarnation also in the church? Well, some would say simply as it has to do with the part of the pagan teachings. Possibly, yes. But why did they uh, actually, if they wanted to continue, why didn't they just continue to teach it? Because, see, they only told you had one life to live here, you see. It was to fool you that this was the only life that you actually could make decisions. So you had, if we live 60 or 70 years or whatever our lifespan is, then the choice simply is that we're under a lot more pressure to find the answers. We're only here for a short period of time. And you have the opportunity now more than ever because you can go on the internet and you can read these books. You can discern and see what is true and what is false instead of trusting someone. And it's actually written in English. It's not in Greek, not in Latin. It's in English. Someone has done the work for you. It is your opportunity to get off this falsehood that's in the church. Think about it. Think about it deeply. And this is what reformers, this is, I mean, this is taught in this is taught in Baptist churches. There's they're just as much a part of the Augustan thinking that the Reformed churches are. They bought into it because it's a slicker commercial. It's a slicker teaching. It's an easier teaching, not easier teaching, but it's easy to fool the flock with, you see. And so people are gullible. 
They buy into it. They don't understand simply is that that what Jesus is saying, that Jesus was an example. See, he was never your he was never your savior. They change certain things in the Bible. And then if you start looking at it not in a literal interpretation, but looking at it in a, a different approach, then you see differently. But your eyes are blinded. You've been taught lies all your life. And it's not just in the church. But the church is simply a belief system. It's where you go. It's where you're taught. You see, you're, you're taught certain things there. And you're taught falsehoods. And you're taught simply is that you're separate than the rest of the people are out here. But in reality, you're just as lost as they are. In fact, you're more lost than they are because they don't buy into that thinking that is the church is going to save them. So you're lost far more than those who are sinners. And it's easy. This group think people in the church get along. They do. They do these nice things together. They have they have picnics and all these things to make themselves. They have their own music. They're in some ways separatists in some ways, but not. You must ask yourself questions. You must understand why you're here at this time in Junction of Life, that you can actually find some answers. You can sit, You can sit, do this through the internet. You can do this. You, could, you couldn't do this 40 years ago. Couldn't even do this 30 years ago. When I was in school, in seminary, you could get some of this information, but very little. You couldn't find this. Now you can find it. If you're looking for something, you can find it. Then you have to discern to see if this is true or not. Well, what are you talking about? So, and most, most are fearful of their pastors. In fact, they say, oh, you know, you shouldn't do this, Brent. Why not? My soul's in danger here. Why not? It's important for me to know. Oh, you don't think it's important. You need to, you need to follow them, go along with their plan. No, that's not what I'm here for, folks. I'm seeking truth. And it's easy. It's easy to go by these things and follow this stuff because it's you were brought up into it. Well, one of them, let's ask another question. So why are people in certain parts of the world Jews? That is, why do they believe in Judaism? Why do they believe in the Buddha? Why do they believe in his other faiths, Islam? Why is it Christianity there? Why? you got to ask yourself some questions here. So why are these people over here in another particular religion? And you notice that Christianity has very little impact upon that. Some will say, well, that has to do with China. They won't let that happen, such and such. Yeah, they allow it. If you really want to go underground church, you can do that, If you, such and such. But the point simply I'm trying to make the point here simply is, is that each certain area of the world has its own religion, its own belief system. It's not all Christianity all over the world, folks. It's not all Buddhism. It's not all John, Johnism, whatever you call it, in Japan. These beliefs, Hinduism. And you notice that these people are raised in this, taught this, and are vividly going to defend it. That Muhammad is... The true faith, that is, Islam is true. Well, why is Islam so determined to do that when they, quote unquote, go in and spell and kill people in Africa? You got to ask yourself these questions, folks. If these truly were people of God who truly are doing what's right, why are they killing other people? Or is your God that type of God? Is it a makeup God? That is, you made a God up. They made a God up. This is what he is. He's a God of war. He doesn't allow others to have other opinions. you got to ask yourself, so why did, why did Rome go to Jerusalem a couple of times, attack it, such and such, and try to take it back? 
and many men died for this. Then what happened later on? Why were the people who simply is that didn't hear this were killed in Europe? It's a fact. It's a total fact. And you say, oh, the church is different. Oh, really? Is it? They can't get away with it now. If they could, they would. Part of that's the separation of state and church. At one time, the church and state were in bed together. And in some ways, they still are. But they can't get away with certain things like they did over a 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. Why does a God have to have a golden area? Why does in Catholic churches see all this gold in their temples, their churches, their cathedrals? Why? Why does it? Ha- why does a God have to have that? Why is it? Think about this. It's a serious business because most of you that is in the church believe this stuff because it's nonsense. That your God needs to have gold? What does your God have to have gold for? Why does your God have to have certain colors? Why does a God, why does your God, such and such your Pope, wear a certain funny hat? Looks like a fish head, which it is. It's a, it's a God of Dagon. Because they're not, they're, 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 they're fooling you. And you give your money, your energy, and believing in that. And you keep doing it. You never even question it. Because you're you're brought up in this. You see, I was brought up in Protestantism. I went to church for over 40 years of my life. I went to church on Sunday morning. I went to church on Sunday night. I went to church on Wednesday night. I even went to sometimes visitation on Thursdays. That's how much I was fooled. I was in it. You see? And so it's easy. It's easy to pass the buck and not see that basically, hey, you know what? I might be fooled here. But no, the ego comes along and says, no, you can't be fooled. You were raised in this. Oh, really? Then why don't you look at the other areas of the world and see what they're teaching? See what kind of preachers, whatever their teachers are teaching, you know, oh, I see they're teaching Islam over there. I see, oh, I see they're teaching Buddhism over there. I see they're teaching over in India, Hinduism. And I'm seeing all this. If it was Christianity was truly, truly true, would it not also be in the whole world? And then also simply is, isn't it also to their development of actually being different groups that fight against each other. Well, it's like to now it simply is the Islam faith, the Muslims, and the Christians, or others in Africa, where Africa is gradually um, coming apart because actually the Muslims are gradually taking over and they're killing people right along the way. And apparently their God believes that that's okay and promises them that they will have, when they die, they have so many virgins to have sex with that's their heaven perspective thinking and these people go out and die fanatics thinking this is true see police are stronger the police are enormously powerful and they know that that's why they teach these things they keep you in bondage so those are you they're still in the church that is the Protestant churches, the Catholic church, even the churches that are part of the free church. That is those who are part of the uh, Anabaptist movement. You see, it's easy to believe. It's a lot harder to dig. But today you have the opportunity of a lifetime, a lifetime to find out the answers if you seek them out. Jesus was just an example, you see, of how you could actually live your life. He was an example. He was not no, he was no savior. 
and they mix that to make it sound this and such. Why do you think they have scribes? Think about it. They scribes. They scribble their own, you know, such and such. They bring it and push it. You, you see, they, it's enormous, powerful when you think about it. When they had scribes during the time of the early church, that is after Constantine. So they could create these books, whatever, and create writings, such and such. Well, I won't keep you. It's about 40 minutes here, actually longer than that, 50 minutes. So I will let you be. Uh, thank you for listening. Again, I'm an example of actually someone who's been in the church for over 40 years and has come to the recognition as simply is this is all about beliefs. And we need to come out of that. And then we need to discern what is true and what is not. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about your soul here. You're talking about something that's important in your life. Maybe there's no God at all. Maybe you're co maybe you're co creators. Maybe you don't know who you are because you've been so mesmerized by so such false teachings that those who teach you are actually using you for their benefit. You see, you have to pay money to the churches. You have to pay a pastor. Well, if God was so great, such and such, why does he need the money? Well, he wants to find out if you're serious or not. No, God doesn't need those things, but people believe in that. They believe what their pastor says, and they go with that, and they hold on to the end of their lives. I remember, if, I will say this one thing, and this is this is a sad story of a person in my family who passed away about uh, 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago. He held on simply as, why didn't God heal him? And he basically said simply as, I'm going to the... Uh, the, you know, to heaven, and I'm going to demand an answer. In other words, he's going to go to the, the gates and demand an answer. Why was he not healed? Now, this is someone who believed in the church, uh, Christianity, all his life. But you could tell simply there was anger within him. Why was he not healed? Well, part of it simply is maybe he was not eating properly and had a belief system that racked his whole body. You see, beliefs have enormous impact upon your body also. So, okay, we'll let you go. You have a good night. Take care. We'll talk to you in time. Bye-bye.